The Right Honorable David Miliband served as British Foreign Secretary from 2007 to 2010. He is presently the President and CEO of the International Rescue Committee, which has humanitarian relief efforts active in some 30 countries and a refugee resettlement program active in 25 U.S. states. Mr. Miliband, thank you for being with us. Thank you. It is widely acknowledged that we are facing currently the largest humanitarian crisis since the Second World War. Why? I think that uh, the crisis has two important dimensions. One is its scale, and the second is its nature. In terms of the scale of refugee flows, 20 million people last year, 40 million, 20 million crossing the borders of one country to another, 40 million internally displaced within their own country. That question of scale is explained to me by three things. First of all, the growing number of weak states around the world that are unable to either meet the basic needs of their citizens or contain difference within peaceful boundaries. South Sudan, the world's newest nation, 11 million people, five and a half million in humanitarian need would be a prime example. Secondly, there is um, a weakness and division in the international political system that it would be foolish to ignore. The, the Syria catastrophe, the Syria implosion uh, speaks to deep issues in the region, but it also speaks to international an international system that isn't working. And the third reason is, is more difficult to talk about, but I think has to be mentioned. Uh, we were, we, the International Rescue Committee, were founded by Albert Einstein in 1933 to rescue Jews from Europe. Today, 40 to 45 percent of our work is in Muslim majority countries. And so the difficulties of certain parts of the Muslim world in reconciling itself to modernity in various forms, the difficulty of um, holding societies together in states like Afghanistan or Syria is a major driver of refugee flows today. And so the scale is explained by those three factors. The, the complexities which we might get into, for example, 60% of refugees in urban areas right. are a function of globalization, really. They are part and parcel of the fact that the world's moving from set places, homes, camps for refugees to a much more fragmented picture and the refugee flow is a part of that. It, that. That's actually something you recently spoke about at Georgetown University is how the humanitarian, the worldwide humanitarian system, if there's a system we can speak of, um, is, is, is really out, an outdated model, right? Because we, we, we find that the, you know, Re refugees in, in, in increasingly are internally displaced. They are concentrated in urban areas. Uh, they are under the influence of non-state actors, and our humanitarian system is not quite equipped to deal with those realities. Uh, I, I wonder if you could talk a bit about that. Our humanitarian sector, and I'll come back to the difference in a minute, but our humanitarian sector is based on short-term displacement after wars between states where people are looked after in camps. Right. And the reality is long-term displacement as a result of civil wars, not wars between states, and refugees going to urban areas, not to camps. So the model's broken. I call it a humanitarian sector because the people in it are united in a sense of common mission of trying to do good, but it doesn't have agreed outcomes, agreed accountabilities, agreed metrics, uh, agreed financial flows. It's a quite a fragmented system where each donor is independent and sovereign does its own thing, each implementing agency like us does its own thing, and the UN is both uh, a funder and an implementer and sits on both sides of the table. So uh, that's why I describe it as a sector. We need to move to become a truly functioning system adapted to the needs of tens of millions of people around the world today, some of the most vulnerable in the world. What needs to happen in order for that to, to be achieved? At the, at the gross risk of, of simplification, I'd pick out three or four things. One we need to agree what counts as success. Right. And we need data, we need, and we need data. I well, imagine. the data comes next. To start right. with, it's actually a deeper philosophical question in a way. Is the responsibility of the humanitarian sector simply to help people survive? Or, given the length, the duration of displacement, do we have to think about how we help them thrive? And that is when, that comes down to, do, are we just a health, an emergency healthcare system? Are we just an emergency protection system for women and kids? Or are we also about education? Are we also about economic livelihoods? My answer to that is we must be about helping people thrive. 30, 38, 40 years displacement in some civil wars. Just to say, we'll keep you alive, but nothing more, doesn't seem to me to pass muster. So one, what are the outcomes? We say survival, but also health, education, income, and the power of the beneficiaries themselves. Second thing that needs to happen is we need much better evidence on what works. 
because in development settings, in poor countries that are stable, there's good evidence about how to deliver healthcare, in humanitarian settings, weak mm. and not enough. Thirdly, we need a real, not just an innovation drive, but a research and development drive, systematic attempts to find breakthrough innovations that can help change millions of lives. Uh, in the way that bed nets have transformed the fight against malaria, we need to be able to make equal progress in tracking people as they uh, flee so that their health needs are met, helping kids get education, going the extra mile to reach the most vulnerable as they are displaced. And so I think that until we get outcomes, evidence going in the right directions, we're going to struggle. Third thing, I said innovation, R&D, and the fourth and final part, the financial flows have got to support an agenda geared to outcomes, evidence, and innovation. And at the moment, the financial flows are very short term and really chasing the cat chasing the tail rather than getting ahead of the problem. So for example, you, the IRC uh, you know, tracks and supports refugees over a period of years, but most of the, the donations for this work are short term, yeah, in, measured in months. I mean, we, 85% uh, of our money comes from governments to whom we are grateful, I should say. But we are a large organization in some ways, we're a $700 million organization, but we're running at the moment 500 different government grants. And the average length of a government grant, to your point, is 11 months. And so if you think about the life of a child born in the Dadaab refugee camp where I was last week, in Kenya, eastern Kenya, the largest refugee camp in the world, 360,000 people, 100,000 of the people there were born in that camp. That is home. And we can't think about their lives and livelihoods over an 11 month period. You've got to think longer than that. Who needs to lead this reform effort? That's such a hard question because of course, um, you'd think the natural in inclination is everyone wants to lead, but actually there's quite a lot of um, uh, deference to others in this sector. My own, because you've got the UN, has enormous legitimacy, you've got donors who've got the money, you've got the implementers like us who've got the expertise on the ground. I honestly don't think the system will change until the donors get their act together. And Both are, private donors and governments. I mean, above all the government donors, but where government is not leading, all of my experience is private philanthropists need to show the way forward. So this applies to all of them. It, the outcome-led grants, evidence-based grants, long-term grants. Now, the, the good news is we're meeting in the week that the World Humanitarian Summit finished in Turkey. It was just a two-day event, one-and-a-half-day event. And the major donors did agree what they call the grand bargain, which is uh, intended to try and address some of these issues of the efficiency of the system in linking donors to implementers, making grants longer term, making the grant process more transparent. And my message was, great to have a grand bargain on efficiency, but let's also have a grand bargain on effectiveness. We've got to do both. Now, the IRC is also working here in the United States in some 20 cities to help to resettle folks. What are the most common misperceptions about uh, those people and these efforts? Well, I think the greatest fear is obviously the, the allegation that far from admitting refugees who are victims of terror, we are proposing to admit people who might commit terror. Uh, you hear that in the politics, we, we all hear that. But 750,000 people have come to the United States as refugees since 9-11. Uh, no Syrian has ever been arrest, arrested for terrorism-related crimes. Uh, five uh, people of the 750,000 have been arrested over the last uh, few years. Um, four of them because they were linked to terrorism abroad, not actually in the US. And frankly, it shows that your system is working, your system in choosing the right people who can become productive and patriotic citizens, uh, following up after a year and then five years before they get citizenship to make sure that things are going right, and using a public-private partnership with organizations like ours to make sure that people get met at the airport, get some housing organized, helped into job, kids get registered, the parents get, get registered at school, parents get taught in English. And so the biggest misperception is that it's a security risk for America. I mean, in fact, it's a great advertisement for America that refugees have come here. Bring me your poor and huddled masses, it says. Um, just right on the Statue of Liberty. The road, exactly, yeah. just a few miles down the road. I think that there are also uh, uh, misperceptions about the economic, quote unquote, burden that these people have. 80% of the Syrians we resettled last year were in work within six months. And when you think about everyone from Andy Grove, the founder of Intel, to Madeleine Albright, 
former Secretary of State, to Sergey Brin, the founder of Google, all refugees, they have become productive citizens by any stretch of the imagination. Frankly, Albert Einstein was a refugee in uh, the US, the founder of the IRC. So I think there's a misperception about that. And um, I think there's a third misperception, which is also quite dangerous, and it's far from a solely American problem. But if you, if you look at the debate in countries like the US, but also the UK, you'd think most of the refugees are in rich countries. You'd think that the 3,000 people in Calais trying to get to the UK are the majority of the refugee problem. Whereas the truth is that 85% of the world's 20 million refugees are in poor countries, not in rich countries. And the quote unquote burden, the load, is being borne by countries like Kenya and Pakistan, and Lebanon and Jordan, not rich countries like ours. Why do you do this work? Because I feel I can make a difference in this way. And my parents were refugees, so there's a, a personal link, but I don't want to add to that. My background in diplomacy, in government, in politics, let me see from one end of the telescope. And now, uh, as a leader of an NGO, I'm looking from the other end of the telescope. And when I applied for the job here three years ago, two and a half years ago, three years ago actually, I applied for the job and started two and a half years ago, uh, I said I, was, I wanted the job for three reasons. One, I thought the questions of how to deliver humanitarian aid in the midst of foreign policy crisis were some of the most challenging questions of public policy. Secondly, I thought the IRC had enormous potential to a lead, not just to be bigger, which we are, but to actually uh, help shape the system because we're focused on crisis. We're not in 120 countries, we're in 30 countries. 30 countries consumed by crisis. Because we've got this refugee resettlement arm as well as our international humanitarian arm, and so we can look across the arc of crisis. And the third thing I said was, people helped my parents. And my dad was a refugee in 1940 to the UK, my mum survived the war in Poland, and uh, was a refugee in 1946. In some way, I'm repaying a small part of the debt that I owe to those people who helped my parents by trying to help some of the people who are in desperate straits today. David Miliband, thank you for being with us, Chief.